to my left is a young man from Barcelona who often gets mentioned in articles and interviews as the hyphen between indie and dance, which is an atrocious uh, expression, indie dance. And you're also doing Balearic house music, which is another atrocious <laughs> expression. So, um, but yeah, we have the man himself here recording for permanent vacation, doing remixes for the likes of the XX, uh, Tahiti 80, um, as well as Shit Robot, for instance, on DFA, which is a great name. And uh, yeah, he goes by the name of John Talabot. And please give him a very warm welcome. Hi. Hello. Um, so, John, you told me that you have a very hard uh, time to define yourself yeah. in music and what you're doing. So, you want to try? Uh, yeah, I, I'm always being situated in the house scene, but I really don't, I really don't know if I make house or whatever. Sometimes I make it, sometimes not. But I'm not sure if house is only the only definition to my music. Like, I don't have like a real definition of my music. So what's what's the definition of house? Uh, I don't know, but I know the style and I know like um, how it sounds, uh, how 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 it's been sounding for these ages. And sometimes like I'm not, I'm not really focused on that sound. Oh, and sometimes I'm tagged like house. So it's like why I'm always tagged like house or tropical or happy music when I'm making some dark tracks. So I don't understand. Yeah, yeah I, for I forgot to mention that um, John is also involved in a label called, I don't know how to pronounce it, Hi Hyfern? It's Ibern. Ibern. It's, it's in Catalan. Yeah. yeah. It's Ibern Discs. Yeah. And this is actually, Ibern is the Catalan word for? Winter. Because it's when we make music in Barcelona. Like in summer, we don't make music. <laughs> it's like we go out like, and we stay like around, but we don't make music. So, Never in summer. As a rule, I don't, I don't know. I, I, but I think that we don't make so much music in summer. Like, I've never had air conditioning in my studio, so I don't, I don't make it. But you, you could, you could move to Madrid, and then you could make music all year from telling from the weather right now. Yeah, but, yeah, but I don't know. I like Barcelona. Like, I, I like the, um, the vibe of, of my city, and I like that, my label is focused there. Like, I don't know. It's it's good for me. It's a good definition, like Barcelona. So it, Barcelona is important for your music. Your yeah. music would sound different without Barcelona. I think so. Yeah. I, I I sometimes when people like ask me if I would move to another cities, it's like I'm not sure because I've seen like a lot of musicians losing their identity, like surrounded by another city, like Berlin. Yeah. I, I didn't want it to say it, but yeah, some musicians like lost like uh, their their feeling of their music, like going to other cities and surrounded by another um, by another atmosphere or by another clubs or whatever. So I like like the city. It's a city that is quite active. It's not the best one for the clubs, of course. There are better cities and better places, but. I like that limitation that we have in Barcelona. It's not a big city, it's a small city, and that's fine for us. It's like we, ha we have our own place there, and we can export like our sound being from Barcelona. So sometimes it's better to be in a small place and export yourself than being in a really big place like Berlin, that there are so many musicians and labels and whatever, or people making music, like it's crazy. Uh, but how did it start for you in Barcelona then? Was there like a certain club or a record shop or a radio show or what was your initiation or epiphany? Actually, I've, I didn't have like an initiation in music like a lot of people had. Like I didn't have like, I don't have big brothers and my mother liked like 80s Spanish bands and my father only blues and some Beatles stuff. So at there was a point that I discovered like the music in the clubs and going to clubs like uh, Nizza or Mook or whatever, like places like that. And I, I go back later, like first I, I discovered techno and later I discovered like Joy Division, for example. 
like it was like my process like I, I i never had an older brother that showed me like joy division or that came to my house with that record or in my school like i didn't have that opportunity so i discovered first like jeff miles for example but yeah what i mean <laughs> jeff jeff mills is quite an jeff uh, mills an alien phenomenon in itself so what what attracted you to i don't know or to when when i went scene? like when i went to a club and i discovered like music I, I've never experienced music so loud, so it, it was the first impression. It was like, what's that like? And uh, later, I I keep going like further in music and discovering like different styles, like um, moving from styles like the first Warp, the first ref Reflex uh, records. Like I don't know all the all the music that I that I could find in a club. I I like to to continue like um, discovering more and more and more until I arrived to the 60s, 50s. Uh, but I, I didn't have like a usual process. Like I didn't discover like music, like if, if you grow up with a, with a band or whatever, like I, I discovered first some, some strange uh, reflex label or reflex lab, uh, records like from Aphex Twin or something like that, than bands that should be more popular. But um, you you started then to DJ, right? From coming from uh, kind of yeah. record collecting. I, actually, no, actually not. When when I like when I started going to the clubs, like it was the problem that there was not so I don't know when you heard a track and the only choice you had to to know it it, it was like going to Soulseek or like buying it in a record store. So it was not so internet or that kind of stuff. So. You you didn't have the opportunity to know so uh, a lot of music by YouTube or going by label or by by artists. So now it's quite easy like to find uh, good tracks or whatever. But like maybe in the beginnings of the of the 2000 and ending of 90s, it was different. It was harder. And if you like a track that the DJ was playing, like you have you had to go to to ask him what was it. And I always went with a notebook like writing it down like yeah yeah like <laughs> a, this is what i want to buy like a like a real train spotter yeah <laughs> yeah totally yeah and you never you never were shy about it because some uh, they call me window leaker sometimes i don't know why because i was in the in the window of the of the <laughs> of the of the dj booth like yeah i remember that and uh, i don't know it was funny but it was different like that today it was i don't know it was hard work. Yeah, yeah, it was hard work, but you didn't have the opportunity to find so much music then. Be before we listen to one of your own tracks to give people an idea what the music sounds like that you're doing, maybe show us one of those window liquor tracks. Um, okay. That you found with a pad and a pen. Yeah. What what was it we just heard? Yeah, this is like a record from D'Arcangelo. It was an Italian act. Like I think it was discovered by Pasolani from his label Nature that they started in the nineties. And it was one of my like favorite records I always wanted to have. Like it was like a golden record, like all the sleeve was golden and it was like some kind of pressure like treasure to find and I, I I just bought it in eBay like when when I when I have a little bit of money because in that time it was quite expensive to find like so it's it's one of my favorite tracks of this act they have another nice record on, on nature like and they release like two albums or three albums and they are playing Barcelona I think this last week they played maybe yesterday or next week I don't know but you didn't go no I was here yeah. and how long have you been searching for that record then I remember that it was like it was pretty hard to find like in that time when I was looking it there was no discogs or discogs was not so active so I had to search it in eBay and make some beatings and sleeping uh, putting the alarm clock at three in the morning to go and make a beat like for a record and my mom was like what are you doing like waking up at three for a beat 
But you know that they invented these sniper programs. Yeah, but for I, I, I was I, I was not sure of how it worked. So you have to leave your login and whatever. And I was not sure. You so. didn't trust the sniper. Uh, this, no, I, I didn't trust. Some people told me that it worked, but I, I, at the time, I don't know if it existed at that time, actually. And do you think, like, I mean, it's a bit of a oh, question, but the modern times, do they take the the fun and the mystery a little bit out of the whole record collecting thing? Because these days it's just, if you're willing to pay the price, you are able to get it, right? Yeah, I don't want to look older when I answer these questions. Like, But yeah, for me, it lost a little bit of magic. Like, I don't know, it's easier now, and uh, but still there are some records that you can find. So at the end, it's what you want to find, and you have the... Uh, force to do it or the energy to do it, you will find it. But uh, nowadays, like I think that these cocks do a really nice job for the vinyl searchers, and you can know the price and you can know like the medium average sale price and that kind of thing. So at that time, it, di never, it didn't exist. And at the end, when you were buying records in internet, you only could hear like a snip, a snippet of 20 seconds of the track, and you had like, oh, what I, what I, what I'm supposed to do. Should I buy this record? Is it strange enough? Should I, will I use it for sampling or will I, will I use it for anything else? Like, I don't know. So at the end, it was your decision to spend like 40, 40 euros in, on, on a record that you didn't know. But sometimes it's, it's, it's good to, to do that kind of crazy things. You, 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 sometimes when you did that, you find really nice records that you never expected. And sometimes it goes horribly wrong, right? Yeah, and you try to resell it. <laughs> it doesn't always work. Um, but yeah, let's let's listen to a track of yours uh, that kind of yeah put you put you on the map. I've got it in here because you forgot to bring it. Oh, Sun yeah. Oh, sunshine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it's called Sunshine. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it was released on winter discs. It was released. No, it was released on May. Uh, it was released just before Sonar, I think, yeah. No, um, I mean, because your label is... Ah, yeah, 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 totally, yeah. It was released on, on Ivern. Yeah, and it was a uh, quite limited release because I wasn't sure of how it, will it go. So at the end, it was like, we did it like 300 or 250 copies. As a first run. Yeah, but it's really strange because then it got like popular and it, but it was reviewed by some media. And sometimes it's quite a strange that it got into huge media a release that it's only on vinyl 250 copies and it's like wow it's like how how it went there like i don't understand and sometimes with internet you have that feeling that everything grows too fast it's like you put something on internet and later some media take it and they put it in another place and it goes to another place and some people retweet it and it's like oh it's 7000 listeners listening to this track it's crazy so yeah that's what i think happened with sunshine i don't think it's my best track I didn't say it, <laughs> but we should listen to it nonetheless. So, um, if you if you look this up on YouTube and go to the comment sections, um, which is not the smartest corner of mankind, anyway. Sometimes. Uh, um, someone wrote quite boring for a long time. Yeah. So. Can you talk a little bit about why? Because most of your tracks are long. Yeah, I, I didn't say they are boring. They are long. What what what's attractive to you about? Actually, actually, when I made that tracks, they were some kind of response of uh, of what I wanted to play. Like I've been playing like resident uh, nights, and uh, I was going to the stores and I didn't find like music that I liked. So at the end, it was there was a point that I was like, oh. What what should I do? Because I don't I I try to buy records, but I don't find like something that it I don't know that it arrives to me like and I want to play like and it's exciting or something like that. So there was one day that I went to a store and I bought like I took like five records to listen something like that and uh, I was there like listening to them and they sound like really like really punchy and really distorted and I don't know. I they was they were really raw, 
and I like that feeling. I, like, I was like, wow, these records are amazing. Like, I want to play them. So I went to, to my home to, to listen to them. And when I arrived there, they were some kind of minimal techno records. So I was like... So you got the wrong bag? No, no. So I went back to the store and I said, hey, um, I bought these records, but here they sounded to me some way. And, um, and at my house, they sounded like like the old the other stuff oh you listen to that th th there yeah it's sorry it's broken like it doesn't sound good so i went to this i i realized that what i wanted it was that kind of sound that it was broken so and when you say broken the record player was broken yeah or the record player was broken and uh, the sound coming out from the headphones was totally devastating so at the end it was some kind of error but i like what i was hearing so I decided to focus on that kind of sound and actually Sunshine and the first tracks, they were only things for me to play in my sets, like because I wanted some kind of this vibe in my sets. So they are quite boring, yeah. I didn't say they're <laughs> boring. They're long, but they're not boring. Yeah, they are long. And yeah. And I was just pointing it out because I think in again modern times and we sound like Old yeah, man it's, now. it's it's long and um, it has like a reason that I want long tracks to play. Like I, I like long tracks to to mix and put some things on the top. So I in that time for me was fine that it was long. Now I don't know. I'm not doing so long tracks, but when you do music, you do it in that time. And in that time, I feeling that my feeling was like. Actually, Sunshine is a, it's a jam session, so it was done like while I was playing with it, and um, and it's the long the long it is because it, I I never cut it or whatever, so it was like that way. So, so what's your what what are your production values when you when I did that I like I had like one sampler and the computer like I had like a ten year old computer that I want to change now because I made the album and renders were crazy there and I want to move to another computer but I I don't know it's my computer and I'm afraid of moving to another computer and not be able to do the same music it's a little bit stupid but <laughs> it's the way it is oh, it, it like I've, I've been working with uh, programs like really old programs like maybe it's Live 4 something like that so yeah, they are quite old. I think that now it's nine, something like that. So the sound changed in that time. So uh, I don't know that I, I can feel the difference between nine and four. And I, so for the first tracks, I prefer a four, four sound. And I don't know. And you mentioned a sampler. Yeah, I had like had like an electric drive, and I had some drum machines too that I use for some percussions. They're like the toms. I think they are taken from a. I'm not sure what drum machine, but they are taken from a, some drum machine, and um, yeah, it, it was quite simple. I, I I I usually, I've been working with really simple setup because I like the feeling that I can control like the stuff. So when you have all the plugins and everything like these days, like you lose a lot of time learning how to use them. So at the end, for me, it was faster to make music with only the things I have, like one sampler and one program and nothing else. And it was more easy for me to control it. Like It was like better for me to make music faster and, and more safe. Like So you would say there is the beauty of restriction? Yeah, totally. I love restrictions. Actually, in the album, I used a lot of restrictions for myself. Like I just say I want to do this track with only this drum machine or I want to do this track with only this synthesizer. One of my favorite styles is Chicago House and Chicago House was born from a four track um, machine and one drum machine and one synthesizer. And for me, it's one of the nicest music ever. So I don't know, limitations are good if you can be creative with them. So you would say if you if you limit yourself you uh, put more emphasis on the musical idea like that it actually that the idea of the track works instead of I don't know 
nowadays you have so many kits and so many stuff like that that you can uh, take like you have to take one snare and you have 3000 snares and you are one hour like so you say oh um, I, I, I lost one hour listening to snares and I don't remember which, one, which were the ones I want to use. So at the end, limitations for me are easier because maybe you can get, uh, you can get like an idea that you were searching, but you limit yourself and you try to find that idea with what you have. So at the end for me, it's easier that way. It's like, I don't, I don't know how to explain it, but I've been losing a lot of time listening to you know, and I've been tired of that. Like, so at the end, I bought some machines for um, not not trying to do that things with kids and everything like that. And we have to get back to the sampler. Yeah, you like to sample, right? Yeah, I quite like. Yeah, records. Yeah, records. Yeah, MP3s. Yeah, everything. Everything. Yeah, everything I can so get. Can you talk a little bit about your sample ethics? There are no ethics. I don't. I don't like ethics. Like I, I don't like the restrictions of, of sampling, and I don't feel like it's creative. Like okay, there was a time that a lot of people like took a, 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 a Latin track and they put like a drum percussion on the top, and it was a girl singing like ah, and some kind of percussion on the top. For me, that's not sampling. You know, it's like sampling is something more more creative. And when I started with my project, I I like about sampling that I could get sounds that I would never be able to get. Like I could never have like five musicians in my studio like recording uh, drums with a mixer of the 60s. Yeah, or having like, I don't know, the best guitarist in the world playing for me. So at the end it's like some kind of vibe that I couldn't get and sampling allows you to do that. And for me it's quite just a game like I try to combine different samplings like a puzzle and at the end it's like it's like some kind of game like you 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 try this and you try that and you try this and you try that and this is good with this part and this is bad with this part so you keep changing and keep tuning and whatever and at the end it goes like Africa you know and it's like oh cool perfect I've made it so it's quite a game so it's a trial and error process or I like it when it's like that yeah uh, I I, in the beginnings when I ma was making tracks, um, for me to play, it was some kind of error and, yeah, error and trial, like what it was good or what it was. It was really simple, actually. It, it's it's really simple. It's, uh, it's nothing that nobody, that all people can do. Like, I don't feel special for doing Sunshine. Like, I think that everybody here could, could do that. So, I don't know. But they would need to find your sample sources then. Yeah, yeah, and 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 uh, I think that every like I've been growing, listening to a lot of music, and I always put like the tracks that I like in a folder, or save the records, and sa saying like one day, yeah, one day I will I, I will use that this, and at the end sometimes you use it for, sometimes it 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 has it has success, and sometimes the track is not good. But I like to collect sounds from different places and I like to buy strange records and I know records that apparently don't have any any special thing. You can always find a special thing. But I think that this is like the hip hop story, like uh, is is what it is. Like I, I, I'm not going to discover anything with this. I only want to put like um some kind of hip hop productions into house. So I was listening to a lot of hip hop like my the Matt Lipa stuff and that and I like the vibe because I like uh, that it sounded organic and at the time I was playing like the records didn't sound it organic or like with some kind of soul they sound really really unhuman so it was like I don't want to play more unhuman music like I don't know I was tired of that that's why I started making my own tracks but how how important is it for you then that like the sources can be uh, detected, you know, like that. Is oh, actually, I don't care. Rec is it you don't care if it's recognizable or not? No, I don't care. If the track is good, like, actually, nowadays, like, you can. I remember when the album of uh, 
the second album of Daft Punk came out, nobody realized that we're all samples. And later with YouTube, everybody was like, wow, they're all samples. It's incredible. Wow. It's a, and I don't know, nobody cares at the moment if they were samplers or not. So I think that that's not important if the track is good. Okay, it's, if you sample like, like Billie Jean and you make like your own track, it's like, oh, cool. <laughs> like really nice. But if you, if you take your time to try to put some elements and samplings together that apparently don't fit together, I think that's a good process to be creative. And sometimes it's like, it's a good way to start with making music. And you've never been afraid of someone knocking? Yeah, totally. Door? Actually, I sample one, maybe the most important bands ever, but nobody realized it. So I, I'm quite happy because I was really afraid and nobody came to, to, to say, hey, you did that. So at the end, it's like, it's the way you do it. It's not what you... And with what, with what ending? If you want to sample the Beatles because you think that that way you will be successful making a version of one of his tracks, you will get maybe busted. But if you use it for a creative, like you like that sound and you want to put it in, a, in your track, I think that that's, that's good. It's not bad. And um, is that also how you approach your remix work then? Uh, sometimes. Sometimes it's... With remixes, it's like a story of hate and love. Like sometimes it's like being a remixer is like the best thing I, I can do in, in, in music. But sometimes it's like it's pretty hard to put like all your effort in making something like of your own you know it's like picking something something from another guy from another guy and making from your own for me it's something exist exist exhausting so i don't approach to remixes only by the samples or whatever sometimes i like to play keyboards or sometimes i only l leave the percussion or something sometimes i use everything and i combine it differently it's not a i don't know it's Every remix is different because every remix has different parts. And sometimes you receive a remix and at the end you decide not to do it because you are unable to do something good. Like, it's like, oh, I, I can't. Like, it's not for me. It's like, it's not, I can't work it. Like, this happens to me sometimes. But they pay you to work it. Yeah, but, but you get paid at the end, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, you say, like, I can do it. Sorry, I, I just try it and I don't feel it, so... I will not be able to do it. No, I meant if that, you know, sometimes people tend to do remixes because they're well paid and then you think no matter if I can yeah, do something. Yeah, uh, of course, it's a good income and more for the people that has labels and have to pay releases. It's like always good to have some incomes because you have to advance all the money for the label. And I put a lot of money that I make in remixes for the label and something like that. And um, yeah, sometimes it's... But sometimes it's good to make remixes. I feel proud of some of the remix remixes I've done. So I'm quite happy with them. Well, do you want to show us? Oh, no, no. One of the, oh, yeah. the <laughs> things that make you proud. So what was it we just heard? It was a remix of Shelter by the XX. And I'm quite happy of, of it. Like it's one, sometimes you receive tracks and you feel you will need not be able to do it better than original and uh, I really liked the original and I was really afraid of doing the remix but at the end with the years I've I learned that it's one of my favorite remixes because I I think it has the the vibe of the original but with my style and that's the point of making a remix I think like putting your point of view on the track and why do you think I wanted the XX your point of view I uh, they didn't want it Actually, it was some kind of strange connection with the label. I was doing a record for the label and they they sent me the record and I was like, wow, I really like this track. And they told me, yeah, you can do a remix. Oh, okay, cool. They sent me the stems and I make the remix. And one year later, they put it out. Like, ah, oh, we, 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 we realized that we like it. And that's how oh, cool, that's nice. So how how hard or annoying is it for you to work with other labels while having your own? Um, it's, for me, it's not annoying. I, I, I think 
sometimes you get better with people and sometimes like it's not so good sometimes there are labels that you, uh, when you work with more big labels to make remixes sometimes it's quite hard because you have deadlines and that kind of stuff that i hate because i can be working like one day in a remix and if i don't like it i have to throw everything so sometimes people don't understand that that at the end is some kind of creative process and you have to you have to be inspired to do it and i know inspiration comes by working and blah, blah, blah. but at the end it's like it's not true it's, you can be like two days three days four days working in something and at the end you say i don't like it i don't want to put it out so you have to start again and sometimes with remixes happens that you receive tracks that they are not good and you have to make them good at uh, your point of view so i don't like to put remixes out that i don't like or that kind of stuff so i if i see that i can do it i say it until and, and if it if it's the deadline and i don't have it i say I, i can do it if i have more time it's fine if not i can do it so at the end it's like what you want to put out and the quality you want to put out uh, you can be doing remixes every week if you want but at the end it's more than a for you don't want to bore people or whatever so i think i've been doing too much remixes <laughs> So you have to learn to say no? Yeah, I have to learn. And yeah, but I, I like to do them. And let me put the other question with the labels uh, a bit. Or let me ask you again in another way. What are you looking for if you give someone your own music then in a label? Is It depends. Sometimes sometimes money, sometimes you like the track. It's like, it's that way. It's, I don't no, want... I, d I don't mean remixes now. I mean your own music. If you ah. want to work with another label and... Because sometimes it's like uh, I like the label and I like I want to be part of it. So at the end, it's like the thing of music is I don't know how how long I will be in music, but I want to be happy after ten years and look back and say I ah, I think I I did the correct and I work with the people I wanted to work and I made the things I wanted to make. I don't want to look back and say, oh, I, I should work with these people or I should work with that one. So if I want to work with some someone, I try to get in touch with them and I try to try to do things with them. And if I don't like the label or whatever, I at the end I say I don't want to work with them or whatever. But yeah, it's something like I don't see it like when when I when I think in my career or project or however you say it it's like i try to be proud of everything i've i do and that's something i have to, i have in my inside you know i want to i want to continue like that i want to be proud of everything i do and i want to be proud of everything i work on and even if the track is is the worst track i want to be happy with the remix and say i've done my best and i think i'm happy with the result so is there a life after music then? Because you mentioned that you don't know how long. I hope so. I hope so. I, I think la m music business is quite cruel sometimes. And sometimes you are here, sometimes you are there. And I don't know where I will be in five years or two years or three years or ten. So at the end, it's like I want to do now what I feel like I have to do. And I want to give the energy to the project that I have. I think it should I receive like I don't want to I don't want to do things that I don't I don't feel and I don't want to put energies in things that I don't feel them so it's like this project for me is special and I want to to feel it like that and if one if in two years arrives a moment that I don't feel that the project have like entity or I don't have anything to do I will I will leave it I prefer to to, to take it out um, Nile Rogers said the other day that he thinks um, when you're a musician or a producer or whatever, you always, and you have fun at what you're doing, you always find a way to make a living out of it. So uh, how, how hard it is these days? What, what do you think about that? I, I suppose that he's a producer and he's quite good doing what he does. Yeah, I guess he doesn't have to of worry about where the milk comes from. Exactly. So it, it's easy to say it like when when you've done what, what you've done like he's like i don't know he's like 
everybody would like to be like like him but i don't have the talent or the skills that maybe he has so i have to accept that and i have to i have to know that my limitations are what they are and i'm doing what i'm do i'm doing but i don't know what i will be doing in f five years so i want to focus now on this project and if this project goes well and i feel and i feel that they it goes further it's cool and if it doesn't work i i will prefer to to leave it apart and say, yeah, that was the project and that was nice. That was a really space, a really special time of my life, and look at like that. And um, kind of connecting to that, um, how hard is it for you to run a label then, or oh, what's the, how do you keep the balance between? For me, it's it's funny, but it's a lot of work because we try to make like special designs and that kind of stuff that have to bring records and make seal screenings and that kind of shit that leaves your house plenty of of uh, ink on the on the floor and you have to clean it later and it doesn't get out easily so yeah the end is something you do for passion you don't get money or you don't get anything only the passion you do it so for me having a label is part of my project too so when you talk about ink and silk screen and so it's obviously you still try to put out vinyl. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I try to I try to put out vinyl and we do it the best way we can, spending more money that than the money we get. <laughs> so it's a little bit suicidal business. But uh, as I said it's part of my project too, so I feel that one part of the money I I get I have to invest it in that. And is it is it nostalgia for you then, or you, um, nostalgia? No, no, it's part of my life. No. It's so you still, I mean, like putting out records. No, it's no, it's a limited business. I know that, but it's not nostalgia. It's something that I want to do and something some something I like to do. But I, I don't, I don't know, I don't know. The repercussion you have when you have vinyl, you have digital, and that kind of stuff, it's, it's the same. Sometimes uh, people go to the <coughs> physical stores to see what's going on, and you don't have the same music in the physical store than the digital store. So at the end, I don't know why, but people like Forte or Caribou, they are only putting out on vinyl. So they are doing quite well, so I think they are on the good way, doing vinyl and that kind of stuff. So we like to do vinyl because it gives you some kind of status too in the musical business. I think, I think that it gives it to you a status. So you th you think if someone puts the effort in putting out something physical, uh, it gives it a, a stamp of quality because he takes the no. he takes the um, no, the no, work no. to do it. You know, no, the quality depends about the music, but he's taking a risk on what he believes. So that's, I think that's, you have to take in care of that. And maybe it's not the best or it's the better music. But if someone decides to spend like 1,000 euros in putting out a release, I think that he believes in what he's doing and you have to take that in care. Um, there's a lot of people that don't trust in his music and don't think is good enough or whatever and they don't put it out on, on vinyl because they think that they're the people that will buy it, don't, they will they won't take consideration of vinyl or whatever. They prefer to buy it on digital and that and that's their, their target, you know. But I don't know. We we like to put out vinyls. We've been buying vinyls for since we were kids and we like to do it. But it's not vinyl only, right? No, 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 it's not. Uh, well, I, I always find it's like kind of very Western civilization thinking in a way that if you put out something that is vinyl only, you kind of exclude a great part of the rest of the world. Yeah. Where you just don't have this kind of old school record shop, DJ business model. You know, every big city has the DJ shop and you go there and you buy records. And You know what I mean? Like yeah, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, like um, if, if you go to um, a city like Sao Paulo, for instance, there's just no shop for DJs. Ah. You know? So you... you yeah, kind people get digital, yeah. But at the end, it's like sometimes you decide to put vinyl because it's something special that you don't have. There is a sampler or whatever that you don't own the rights or whatever, or 
I don't know, for different reasons, you can make it special and make it only limited or make it, I don't know, like being on vinyl and in digital, it depends about about the label conditions. Some people want to put everything on vinyl and only 500 people have that and later spread, like internet will spread the release in a lot of forums and on some parts of the world through different websites, blogs and whatever. And sometimes labels prefer to get money from the digitals and put it out in vinyl on digital and sometimes they decide only put it on digital and I don't know. I, I don't think it's I don't think it's important if the music is good. Like I don't see I don't see if it's if it's important or, or not. I, I don't I don't understand if a track is better for being in digital or, or vinyl. Like uh, if a track is good, it's good. But sometimes there is a I don't know how to say it in 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 English, but some kind of mysticism of vinyl. Like, yeah, I have to get that because it's only on vinyl. I will get out of like in this cox it will raise until forty euros, and I will don't have that release or whatever. And that kind of things that uh, it's better than the stock market at the moment. Really? Yeah. So. Uh, actually, I've seen records that they go out to eighty euros two weeks after they get out. So yeah, that's what I mean. Like some people goes to the store like buying two for like gold. Like yeah, in two years I will I will buy I will sell them. So yeah, maybe you're you're, you're right. And uh, we talked about restrictions. You kind of restrict yourself as an artist, not with what you put out, but it's actually kind of uh, new for you to sit here on in front of cameras, right? You try to keep your yeah. face out of the limelight. Can you talk a little bit about that? What's the... Yeah, well, that was that was totally an artistic decision. I didn't want to do photos with my face or whatever. So at the end, I decided only to make photos not showing my face. It was not some... It was not... Didn't have anything to do with burial or things like that. I play with my face. I don't wear a mask or whatever. It was... You play with your face. Yeah, I play with my face, like the way it is, and that's nice sometimes, and sometimes it's not so nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you look all right to me. <laughs> but yeah, uh, it was. I didn't want to have that typical photos of DJs or sunglasses, artists. headphones. Yeah, I don't. I didn't feel it. I want to do something different, and I didn't want that people like realized who I was or how I dressed or whatever, I wanted to be more, I don't know, um, ethereal or something like that. And for the first years, I only had one logo and that was for me enough. I didn't want anything else. Like, and I don't do a lot of interviews and that kind of stuff because I don't, I don't need to do that. Yeah, how did it work for you then? I mean, how, how did people react? in these days with like Facebook video raves and some uh, people some people get more angry than others and don't understand it but at the end it's some artistic decision and they have to understand that if I'm for example I'm doing this because it was something I wanted to do because it was for students of the academy and I want to do it but sometimes it's like I we want to do like your interview for um for a TV or whatever and it's like I know what questions you will ask me and I don't want to to be there. What questions will they ask you? I don't know. Why are you showing your why are you not showing your face or why like I just did. Yeah, and at the Yeah, but but we are we are here and and I understand that you have to do that question because it's part of my project and it's kind of my restrictions too, but it was something that I want I I didn't want to have my face in magazines or something like that and I feel strange with that. I I realized that I didn't feel comfortable with that and it was better for me putting some kind of paper in my face. And speaking of artistic decisions, what was your artistic decision to do an album? Like, I mean, you more or less do music that is kind of oriented towards the dance floor. Yeah. Depends on the dance floor, but like it's music you can dance to often. Yeah, sometimes. And how hard was it for you to kind of or not hard but what was your concept now to do an album it's not full of dance tracks is no it? you heard it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and no it was it was a decision like i wanted to make an album like uh, without any of the tracks i previously released and i wanted to be an album like 
that it was not focused in any age or any, I don't know, any time. So I wanted to make new tracks with different vibe. Um, it's a mixture of 80s, 90s tracks. I don't know. It's. I wanted to be to do something that has some kind. It's really typical what I'm saying, and I think like I, I would like to explain it better in a better English. But I wanted to make something like it has some. Uh, cohesion between between it. I didn't want to have like really punch tracks in the middle or I don't know, I didn't want to have uh, I wanted to have like a whole concept and I think that it was a dark concept. It was uh, I didn't want to set the album in a special age or when you listen to the album I don't know if you have the feeling that it's made nowadays or it could be made like 20 years before. Or But it's made in the winter, right? Yeah Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, but some tracks were finished in summer in my studio sweating like that. I have to finish this, like I have to finish this. It was some kind of titanic work, but yeah, I, I think I put too much of myself in the album. I, I took it too seriously and I'm not, so sh I'm not sure if it will, it will work out. At the end when I listen, it's like, oh, maybe I've, I did some strange thing that I shouldn't. Should we listen to a strange thing? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm gonna put the only track that is dance track. The only. <laughs> <laughs> So, but you played like the the dance track of the album. Yeah, right? the the last one. Yeah, I I I I didn't know which one I had more, so I played this one. And uh, the voice is sampled, or yeah, it's sampled and it's it's uh, um, sing by Pional. It's a friend of mine here in Madrid, and yeah, we combine sampling with with uh, with his vocals to make like that kind of dif different effect. So even if you have a singer, you sample him. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I, I I didn't think of that, but yeah, I like to manipulate like the vocals like the best I can. So sometimes it's for me easy to have like a vocal and do my job having the vocal and rearranging it the way I want. That have someone and say, go ahead and sing. Sometimes for me it's easier that have the vocals and use it the way I I like as it they would be an instrument or something like that. So you, re you, so you re record the singer and then send him away and do it? Not always. Like, for example, in Families, I did all the track and later I met the girl. We decide which vocal track, which vocal theme we wanted. And we he's, she sing on the top and it was perfect. But sometimes for me, it's difficult to explain to a singer what I want because I'm not singer and I'm not musician. And I don't know how to explain myself in English. So sometimes it's hard. You could find Spanish singers. <laughs> yeah, but they don't have good accent in most cases. So that's that's true. They could sing Spanish. Yeah, they could sing Spanish, but uh, the, I haven't I haven't made the Spanish track. <laughs> like, I don't know. I have to. And it would sound strange to you on a track like this have someone singing in your no native tongue. No, no, not at all because you can understand what he's saying. So. I don't know. Sometimes Spanish is Spanish people has some kind of feeling that it doesn't sound good or whatever or and sometimes it's difficult for us to hear a track that you made in Spanish. For example, I don't know when I listen to some Spanish tracks, there are a few musicians that I like that they can sing in Spanish like El Quincho is one of of them. I think he has made his own style singing in Spanish. And I think this is really, really difficult. But I don't feel like at the moment working in Spanish. <laughs> But maybe, maybe in the maybe future. Maybe in the future, yeah. And uh, you mentioned families. Yeah. That, that was for young Turks. Yeah. So, and is another one of the... It's, uh, it's part of the four track EP that was released on Young Turks. And one of them, my main objectives was working with a, with a singer that was Glasser and... 
I really like his vocals. So I tried to meet her in London and make the 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 make her sing on the top of the track and I think it I, I'm quite happy with the results. Like I really like the track, I feel proud of it. But the album won't be released on Young Turks. No, it will be released on permanent vacation. Yeah, I think it's quite strange for them. But I think it will be okay. Why, why is it strange for them? I don't know, because when I listen to the album, sometimes you feel like maybe it's not people what expect from a label like permanent vacation. But I don't care too much because they decided to put it out and it's their label, so they will know what. They are, they are doing it what they want. So at the end, it's like I give them the album and they say, yeah, we like it, we want to do it, and it's the, we will do it like your way. Like They didn't ask me changes or whatever. But I know, I know that sometimes f people focus permanent vacation in, in a style or whatever, and it's difficult to put some music in there. My album is quite strange. So and and why don't you put it out yourself? Like because you have your own label, so you could be artist and label owner in one person and have total control about everything. Yeah, that's true. But <coughs> I signed a contract with Permanent Vacation, <laughs> and I want to release it in there, of course. But uh, there is some relation with them, and I think that they trust in the project, and they want to do it. So I think they. They have to. So you think it, it's also important for an artist to sometimes give his stuff away to someone to yeah. make them work with it? Instead yeah, I've never worked an album before. I would like to. But I think that I need distance from my music and I need to give it to another person finished and say, okay, now it's your job and I won't do anything of that. Like It's your time. It's You have to invest your time in selling it or whatever or throwing to the fire. But... I don't have to do anything with it. And they didn't want you to put your face on the cover to, to Yeah, sell it's it? my face on the cover. Like, no, uh, they they don't they really don't care about it. Like they are really nice people. <laughs> oh, that's that's good. So should we maybe open it up for some questions from the audience if there yeah. are any? The microphone is Hi there. Um, sorry, this might not be a completely fully formed question. Um, we were talking, I, I was talking with people earlier today about the concept that if you record a human voice, that even if it's only a short, a short amount of the voice, that it captures something about the life that, that they've lived and their experiences. Um, do you think that, like, do you share that sort of opinion, or is that anything to do with why you sam sample things? Oh, I, I think I don't understand the question. Um, <laughs> because it's 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 my fault. It's because no, no, of, um, of the English. Like, so if you if you sam if you sample someone's voice, then you have even even if it's a really small a small amount of the voice, there's an element of the the experiences that that person's had or the life that they've lived or the things that they think or you know even if it's just a really small amount and i wondered if that's an opinion that you share or if it's anything you've thought about in relation to you know because talking about sampling and even yeah. sampling someone that you've got access to i don't know if it's about like the sample in itself or how you use it in the track like sometimes using a really short uh sampling of voice it can give a, how do you say, high, uh, uplifting moment that, for example, in the rave moments, they used to put like that kind of vocals like on the top to put in that moment, like the... The, the climax. Yeah, the climax of the track. They put like a repetitive vocal and that vocal, like it reminds you some moment. But I'm not sure if it's the vocal in itself or how, how you use it or... I don't know if I understood the question. Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> I suppose that, that's kind of what I mean, is whether there's, you can look at it as a, it's kind of a, almost a technical, a technical yeah. exercise. You know that you, you pick out a vocal and you know that the, the simple, the, the, the sonics of it mean that people will feel a certain way. And so then it could, you know, it, it doesn't matter about... Yeah, but I think it's related... Or, you know, or it could be the other way where, where 
it's more about the feeling of the person who originally recorded it and you're kind of tapping into their life or something. Yeah, but sometimes it's like you distort so much the yeah. vocals that at the end it's not even that person, you know, it's like it, it, you don't understand what you're saying. So at the end I think it, it has something more to do uh, of how you relate it to a style or to a moment or to a, an age or to a track that reminds you that that vocal or whatever and you feel like, yeah, that's good because it reminds me that way or a lot of people is using that resource for doing like dubstep and that kind of things, you know, like pitching vocals and, uh, or for example, the knife, use it like the pitch, uh, how do you say when you pitch go? Shift. Yeah, pitch. pitch shift it down and they have that kind of strange vibe on their vocals. So I'm not sure if, if it's what it says or what you record people, if it's the effect on itself that it has to do with the, with the feeling that you, that you have, you know, it's like, it ha it's how you modificate the vocal. And for example, I'm not good with lyrics. I don't, I don't make songs. So when I was doing the the track with Glasser, I explained her what I wanted. But I, I I'm not, I'm not really good with with lyrics. Like saying, yeah, I want to, I want to, f I feel this and I want to say it. Like, and for me, it's really difficult because I don't, I'm not sure I can do, I can do it. But um, using vocals for me, it's like using an instrument too. So I like to use it that way because it's the only way I know. Like, and it's for giving some kind of feeling to the tracks and not using only a synthesizer and using a vocal too. And it's been that way since I remember yeah. like music from the 80s and 90s. It's, it's it doesn't really have to make lyrical sense to you? No, no, not at all. Even if, if, uh, I'm, as I told, I'm not good as with lyrics and with songs and that kind of things. So at the end, I like the vibe that a vocal gives it to me, but I don't care what it is saying or what language or what, whatever. I, I don't, I don't. Unless it's not Spanish. Right? Yeah, unless it's not Spanish. That's that's true. Another one. Can you pass the mic, please, or? Um, what are your plans regarding a live act? Can you give us some details on how is this going to be? When? Uh, I don't know when, but I would like to make it with another person. Like to have like some vocals of the on, in the tracks and can play some stuff together with him. And uh, I think I will do it with Pional too. And we are we need to prepare that. But I didn't want to be with a computer doing the live show because. At the end, I've I've been doing this in my studio, and I I don't have a lot of fun doing these kind of things for a live show. So at the end, I, I'm preparing with percussion and that kind of things, like more maybe band oriented, but not like a band because we are only two persons. So it would make more sense in like a festival than in a club, or I'm not sure. Actually, it's quite strange because now I've seen a lot of live acts that they are using, like from. Um, electronic artists that they are bringing like the band concept again to the club like like the live act of Nicolas Jar something like that that they are bringing again instruments to a club and it's really nice because people react really well to that to that vibe you know I think people has been a little bit tired of looking to people with laptops or whatever so they really are happy to have like people playing stuff in a club too yes please <laughs> Hi. Hi. I uh, really enjoy the music. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Simple question. Uh, why Why drums? Why drums? <laughs> oh, I don't understand. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think for me personally lately, I've been going through this like battle in my head of like, why do I even need drums for some things? Um, and I, I hear like your stuff is really like ethereal. <laughs> And like dreamy, and I can almost imagine some of it is just like long, extended, almost like ambient pieces. Um, I'm curious if you ever do that stuff, and then say, "Oh, I need to put drums. Like this need these need this needs drums." Or like, no. Actually, what is it about the 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 percussion? That actually, I uh, actually when I start making music, usually I I do more. The first part I do is like the 
the drum programming. Like it's something I really enjoy to do. And when I started, like as I said, when I started the project, the only thing I was looking for is some music that I feel that I wanted to play in my sets. So yeah, it was, it was uh, at the beginning, it was created for that reason. That's why they are long tracks and they are boring tracks and they are... I didn't say they are uh, boring. No, no, no. I, I, I say because of the YouTube people that say that, that... YouTube people. Yeah, yeah. I really take in consideration the YouTube people because they are the people, you know? Yeah, they are, yeah, yeah. They are sure. the people. So uh, I have to think in this... I, I will speak with that guy, I think. I, Send I will him ask, a message. I will ask some, some, I don't know, what I should do with my tracks to make it better. So... <laughs> So at the end, the, the drums is, is part of, of my music, and I think it's, uh, it's so important, uh, the drums than the, than the melodies or whatever. It's like the combination of both. So I don't know why they say ethereal. I think it's quite aggressive. And I didn't want that for the album. That's why I reduced the drums in the album. I, I didn't want like an album of like 11 tracks with punching your head like over 50 minutes, like, like sunshine. It's like I will get mad. I, I've never listened to a complete uh, album, house album, I think. I only listened maybe the Daft Punk album complete or some other bands like that, but I've never, I've never listened to a complete house album as it is. Like, uh, so I didn't want to make a house album. Sure. Uh, have you considered making tracks without drums? Yeah. Yeah, but I've never done it. <laughs> it's, so, it's, it's scary. <laughs> so maybe, maybe, maybe it doesn't have sense for me at the moment. I don't know. Cool, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing? As far as your uh, creative process goes, and you said you like to start with the drums. Um, if you could sit here and tell us in an order of like the arrangement of how you go about arranging a track, like how long does it take you? Oh, it depends. It really depends about. Uh, for example, sometimes I I like to sample like a whole drum kit I found in some records, and I have mainly that. Uh, I like to use I like to use sometimes the the drums as melodies, so I like to tune it to make melodies with drums or like maybe uh, sub frequencies to take it to the tune of the track. So it depends a lot of what I'm looking for the track. But what I've been doing uh, in my tracks mostly is like finding like a good kick drum <laughs> first. And when I got that, I moved to the other parts. Like I've been focusing kick drums because I wanted that my tracks I want. I wanted to get punchy, and it has a bit of relation of what I was listening to that time. I wanted. I was listening to hip hop, and I wanted to have that feeling of the kick drums that were more analog, more live. They were not so digital and that kind of stuff. So I was looking for that vibe. I. I, I didn't. I didn't got it how it, I wanted because it doesn't so, sound so analog that I wanted. But it's quite the way I could get it. You know, it's like the vibe I wanted. But it has more relation. Like when I st when I start making a a rhythm, I usually start like with the simple like claps, hi hats, <laughs> and drums. Like this is uh, how I learn to DJ and the par the things I like when I I, I feel a, a a rhythm. It's like I'm quite simple in that. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I found it good that you said that you guys didn't make music in the summer yeah. because I think a lot of us like over fixate on just making music 24 hours a day, you know, and um, I just want you to talk about what p taking summer into winter and being creative does. Uh, the creative process is something that I've been, uh, how do you say it in English? I don't know, I, I experienced this year like a hard creative process with the album and I lost like part of my life in in the way. So it's been a little bit painful because uh, I've been trying to put a lot of effort in an album and when I sit to make music, I never know when I will finish. There is some people that 
they know that they will spend like four hours doing a track and they will get something. And I'm not that kind of people because I think I'm not a good producer. I think you're a great producer. No, no. Producer like, like producer, like you sit down and you do your job. It's like, like when you pay f to a producer, it's like because you want a guy at your side that comes here and say, okay, we will spend like five hours and we will get a rhythm, a melody, and we will have a track. Like the dream. If you see in the videos of the dream yeah. in internet, like doing a track in 45 minutes, like and he makes like two hits. So that that's what why what when you want a producer, like you want a guy in your side making that. And I don't do that because I don't feel it and I don't get the point. So at the end, it's like my creative process is really slow, and it, that's why I took so long <laughs> in making an album. And I spend winter and summer doing it. And I don't know what else to say. <laughs> Thanks. Any more? So I guess that's over. That's over. <laughs> John Talabot, thank you very much.